Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. I am Shamika Berry, the Outreach Specialist at the Akakik Foundation, and today I am joined by my very good friend, Gabrielle Tayak. And we wanted her to be the focus of our Women's History Month presentation this year, 2022. And we are so honored to have you join us today, Gabrielle. Can you please just tell us a little bit about yourself and some of your passions and let our audience know why we love you so much. Oh, well, it's so good to be with you, Shamika, and especially in the forum of, of Akokik, which is so dear and profoundly um, deeply connected and interconnected to my life and, and energizes so much of, of what I do and, and motivates uh, me. So I am currently um, an associate professor of public history, public history meaning history that goes out to the public, like what Echo Geek Foundation does, museums and blogs and podcasts and anywhere where we can transmit that history. So I'm at George Mason University University. Um, I'm also a Piscataway woman, so I'm a, a tribal uh, woman from uh, the area that that Akokik has the heart of our of our homeland, uh, right there on the Potomac River. And I've been um, a, an advocate, an activist. Um, I'm a scholar uh, as well. I was at National Museum of American Indian for uh, many many years, and also involved with um, I've been involved with Echo Geek Foundation as well, along with other uh, local and, and international places that move awareness into rights and, and understand how, how history and structures shape us. I am entirely passionate um, about uh, seeking and enacting justice as an act of love, as the great Dr. Cornell West says, how justice is love what love looks like in public and um, carrying on lineages, but also transforming them. I love being by the water. I've reconnected um, very deeply and also um, really motivated by uh, my children uh, who are now grown, um, <laughs> <laughs> like very grown, but also in terms of creating communities and and, ne and networks that that reconnect us to a life source. That's wonderful. What brought you to the work that you have been doing for your entire life? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, and it really is a lifelong, you know, thinking about it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be turning 55 this year, right? And um, <laughs> we're just, you know, getting into this uh, younger elder phase and it's a point where we can start to shift and reflect and, you know, we, we can be so involved with doing things that uh, coming back and saying, well, what, what was I a part of? Like, how did this happen? Um, because usually I'm in the position of and have seen myself in the position of supporting other, you know, mm -hmm. other people, right? Which I still do. But it really came from... Um, I mean, very early on, uh, I grew up in New York City. Uh, my father, Joe, uh, who was uh, the middle son of uh, Chief Turkey Tayak and also Mary, um, had gone out to sea when he was a very young man, uh, when he was 16. And he left and had felt and had experienced a lot of um, really actually very painful racism, um, mm -hmm. abuse, but also always knew where he was from and had gone out into the wide world and was very informed by his, his experiences um, out in the world um, since 1944 and, and ended up being also, when he was on land, an artist and a writer and a chess player and a <laughs> devotee of Julia Child, thank goodness for me. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, but also was was very clear about um, what, what power was about, 
and and the abuses and processes of power and and what it meant to be um, to seek freedom as a as a person and also understanding who he was and then also from my my mom's family a jewish family uh, from upstate new york and so really coming into those questions of from both of those pieces um wanting to know why things were the way they were understanding that there was so much more of a deeper history um growing up uh through the 1970s and seeing all of these waves of of movements and expression um and then wanting to know um always knowing that i was piscataway and, and involved with the native community in in new york um city and then traveling back down to onto the potomac right we would always come back and see the family starting to really wonder you know what what happened to us and 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 what those connections were and feeling this you know when you're young i think it's like a fire mm -hmm. you know like you feel a fire of it and and watching how it was connected into the world and um, seeing where where things were happening with other people. And I, I was also in Central America during the war. Um, I was in the in Amazonia um, mm -hmm. during some of the dispossessions and wanting to understand, you know, what, what had happened, what was happening there and trying to see it as a way of, of understanding, um, you know, what had happened to us. And so taking a, taking both a, an activist uh, stance and an organizing, but also a scholarly one. So pursuing um, a doctorate uh, so that I could understand how to, how to um, study. So pairing those things mm -hmm. and then building community too, right? Because I, I think, yeah, it was like the first part was really about uncovering injustices and pushing doors open. Um, I'm very thankful to my late uncle, uh, Billy Tyak, for example, who was part of that early movement. You know, being in the DC area, right? You have waves and waves and waves of people coming in. So you can be in place. Like my dad went out into the world, right? Mm -hmm. And then like here, um, the world comes to you. Right. And pay attention. Right. And then understanding like more and more about about these stories. So it really was this early um, information about and, and also about like, well, what could I do? The fact that, um, you know, as a as a as a Piscataway person, right, understanding, you know, all of what all of the other parts of me, but you know, <laughs> having that connection. Right. Um, it's like, all right, we're um, the ones who made it. Mm -hmm. So there's a responsibility for the ones who didn't. I think that's a lot of what happens in your work too, right? Yes. You know, that, that, that you, you were given that, you know, for whatever reason, right? It's like, I always feel like it's a, it's 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 accident it's spirit it's opportunity <laughs> it's merit right right I feel it's, it's like place, a calling right? like how is this right it's a calling and some of us get it and and being supported um by that and having that opportunity to be engaged actively but also take the time to really deeply figure out what happened and now what are we going to do mm -hmm. um, you know so yeah it's that first part of of um of opening, of demanding, protesting, all things that have to happen that way. And then coming into this part of my life um, where it's saying, well, how do we, how do we restore and how do we um, reconnect and, and allow time for beauty as well and, and peace, you know, there's, I almost feel like you know it's like a time of fire and it's a time of water now mm -hmm. and and that's really um you know where where it comes from and i think it's really a time of women i mean and the 
and the feminine women in, in, in all of the definition that you might embrace that term and, mm-hmm. and this feminine um, presence that balances out. And that's what I, I think has, you know, and of course it's, you know, it's age and, um, <laughs> and, 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 and where we are and the opportunity that we have to say, wow, we fought so hard for things and maybe now we can sit and understand what all those birds are, you know, what, what is that leaf anyway? And uh, <laughs> a lot of us got just, you know, look, we got dispossessed of any of us. Some, I mean, there's community that's been in place all along, but a lot of people have been dispossessed and are, are wanting to come home. So how do we affect that? Um, and that's been a lot of my interest in, in going into the teaching and um, trying to combine those those things. It's not just like, oh, I do this, like, I do this by day and that by night, you know? <laughs> it's all so, encompassed. It's, it's all, all encompassed. kind of like, all right, let's pull it together, you know? And so, I mean, that's really, um, that plus so many teachers and mentors and um you know, both the ones who support you and the ones who are not so support, you know, like all those pieces kind of come together and it makes you the person that you are. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so glad that I've been back in this beautiful homeland. I've been back here full time since 1993. Mm -hmm. Um, Really started to come down more when I was about 15. I would just like come down on the bus, come down on the train, you know, (laughs) Uncle Billy would come pick me up, you know, and so it was, it was really, yeah, it's been a, it's been a good pathway to be able to start to do this on our own terms too. That's wonderful. You talked about being a younger elder. So how do you see the experiences that you've had, the research that you've done, the educational background that you have benefiting you as you make that transition into the, the elder ranks? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, um, I think that's a great, that's also a great question. It's, it's really, um, you know, it's Piscataway and it's also in, you know, an indigenous sensibility. It's also human sensibility, right? It's not only like within a, a tribal community. I see myself very, you know, very mm-hmm. globally connected and that's been a part of my life all along. Um, I had a lot of this came together. I mean, it was moving because I, I've always worked with oral histories and listening. Like mm-hmm. I've always listened to people, like not just in the family and the community, other people who've come through um, people like um, Roberta Black Goat, who was a Navajo Dine um, elder uh, from, from the Four Corners, who is working very hard to hold on to her land. People like... Hazel Little Hawk from South Dakota, others that um, were really standing up with that deep concern, I think, and knowledge about what do we pass on to the next generations? Because, you know, when you, and you, you get that sort of abstractly when you're younger, but when you get older, now you've seen people actually grow <laughs> up, right. <laughs> like, right? And like, you can like see like a whole person become a full adult um, after you Mm -hmm. and say it really matters about what that per I mean like we know this but like when you really see it it becomes it becomes something into itself and then I had this amazing opportunity which really galvanized it uh, for me of, of understanding, especially with Indigenous elder women. And some of that also had to do with um, people who have been mentors and teachers, like there's a, a, a late great uh, religious scholar, scholar of religion. Her name was Ines Talamantes, who was Apache in Chicana. She was my an advisor of mine um, as, a, as a scholar, but also you know, as a person spiritually, um, others like a woman named Dr. Charlotte Heth, who's a Cherokee ethnomusicologist, but also really engaged in community. And then I had this opportunity um, for about two and a half years with a program that was sponsored by Rockefeller Philanthropy um, called Spirit Aligned Leadership Program. And this was, this, and it still is, a, a program that developed by um, 
the indigenous elder women themselves wanting to uplift and support um, that grandmother role of indigenous women from across um, the US and, and also Canada, mm -hmm. who would be like, we're like treasures. And I think that the, they, as they rose up, they reached out to me and they were like, would you ever consider leaving Smithsonian and joining us? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so who knows if that was like wild or what, but I just felt again, you know, this calling, like kind of seeing, all right, what's consistent for why I got into this work in the first place. And having been at an MAI for about 20 years, which was amazing, 18 years, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but also feeling like that original core of what, what I was doing was to work with um, people who are really knowledge holders. And so going into this process, so it was originally a, um, a circle of, a circle of eight um, women um, who I was asked to personally curate their knowledge for them not for a museum, not for an institution, not for an organization, but to sit with them and go and, and spend time with them in their places mm -hmm. uh, and, and see what kind of legacy they wanted to leave and also uh, make sure that it was protected. So spending time with people like Henrietta Mann, who's uh, Cheyenne, and there's actually also uh, some of them, you know, interesting. Some of them, you know, had multiple roles, a, a mm -hmm. prayer leader, but also a scholar. Sitting with her, going through two giant storage lockers, <laughs> and, stuff, and, and then also going, you know, on long, we're driving these long Oklahoma dusty roads where we could see where the encampment was, where she had been born in 1934 and where she had been raised for the first years of her life by her, her grandmother was actually her great grandmother, white Buffalo woman who had survived the massacres of the 19th century, literally actually was a survivor of like wow. Wichita and Sand Creek and um, going out into Hopi Mesas with people like uh, Barbara Poli and, um, seeing what, what she, how she had transmitted leadership going on to the Pueblos and, you know, and I'm not super, like, it's so funny. Like people are like, wow, you must be up. Like, I am not intrepid. Like I, like, I was like screaming, crawling up the ladders <laughs> <laughs> in the Northwest coast, you know, they're like, get in the boat. I'm like, okay. And so, <laughs> but, you know, just doing it and like walking, walking the, the the for the northwest coast pacific forest with a person like Yvonne Peterson from Chehalis and and spending this very immersive time um with them clan mothers at Mohawk who were um reinstituting rites of passage for people so this was a very intensive you know spending time with women in those places um and I think that it it really it it really pulled together what yeah what does it mean to be a, an elder person what mm -hmm. does it mean to be um, an elder woman um, and what I noticed was that every single one of them um, I almost was like wow we should do like house like indigenous like HGTV because <laughs> like, like even in like more humble spaces, but they had all created, I mean, every single one of them had created these home-based places that were just very nurturing and beautiful, whether it was like a hand-built adobe place um, or um, one that was made completely out of pine and wood with healing gardens like up in Canada or um, places that were like out on the mesa. They all created these home spaces that were for their community um, that understood all of the struggles and issues and, and the fact they were like elders for our times. These are not, you know, people who are like up on the mountaintop fully, you know, pristine and like, you know, these are people who had been through also 
you know, traumas, boarding schools, had mm -hmm. been in relocation to urban areas, um, had traveled sometimes, you know, has been in the military, like divorces, deaths, like all kinds of issues coming up, you know, addictions and substance abuses in their, in their families and community. I mean, like real stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and that, um, you know, it, it, that to me said, okay, now it's time to bring this back home on this next level and, and see how we can establish it. Cause I, I would, honestly, I was, I was on the road about a week to 10 days a month for that. And it was very intensive. And so I felt like, you know, when I had the opportunity to like come back home with it, I was like, okay, like, yeah, this is it. And get into university. And, and this was really, but it was such an important transition. You know, it was like this, this link of like, okay, this is really defining what, mm -hmm. what needs to happen and, and coming back and sitting uh, with another elder guide um, who's also been very supportive of Akaki Suzanne Harjo and listening to her growing up stories, another Cheyenne woman who very involved with policy and legislation and still is amazing. And so kind of transmitting these stories, but also and continuing to do that, but also understanding, okay, so where, where am I, where, where can we be? Um, you know, knowing that, that every, you know, things are so much in process and we all have a lot of, a lot of work to do and um, restore, you know. So, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really understanding also those connections to like where we are at, at, you know, in a place like Akokik or on the Potomac, there's a deep indigenous history and it's inextricably linked to the histories of enslavement, you know, like that land is cleared because, you know, for, for, for profit and, and labor. And so those were other pieces. Like it just, just made it so that it's not just like this piece and that piece and that piece. It's like so con combined. And so how do we, you know, for me, like it was really a question of, again, bringing it back to this interconnectedness, mm -hmm. understanding the global systems, but also where we are. In, and as, and as, as women and, and uh, women and, um, uh, looking at at what our roles are, this is so much of it. What I've noticed also in historic research, right? So much of women's history is erased. So it's like this mm -hmm. double, triple erasure, um, and starting to just be open to things. So finding um, you know, there's a, a link maybe to this history of a Piscataway woman chief named Nancy mm -hmm. that popped up been a digitized search by accident for me um, about initially about 10 years ago. And I kind of let it sit for a while and, right. you know, nobody had ever heard of her. Mm -hmm. She was the last um, traditionally presenting, meaning the way that she interacted with, with the colony by sending a speaker, by having her role. She is the last, you know, in the archives recorded as such traditional power holding person um, from the Piscataway chief, um, you know, wow. who sued, who sued the constable for robbing her daughter's tomb. And then here we, you know, this is goes on to about 1712. And then, you know, we loop back and um, in the 20th century, we have grave protections, right, issues mm -hmm. continuing. And then 21st century where everybody, you know, legislation is passed and we're all on the same page. So, you know, how do we protect our ancestors and also grow, you know, how are we not just constrained by, you know, saying like everything needs to be exactly, like, no, it's like we, we're, we're, we are interconnected people. Piscataway yes. people are blended from the beginning, I think. And I like to talk about it by love and by force. Mm -hmm. you know and so it's um yeah it's kind of, it's it's really a, an amazing time and um and also what we've all been through you know in the past couple of years which just right. adds a layer onto onto everything else right um right. so yeah so having that that possibility and i think supporting other elders and also understanding that you know, we talk about young people going through rites of passage. I think elders need to go through rites of passage too. Yes. If, if 
you know, it's, it, we're just all kind of talking about that now. Like, what yes. is that? How, how do we do that? You know, um, because we're all experiencing something and not naming it. Right. That is an excellent point. We have to know where we have come from to see where we are, to know how to navigate where we need to be. And that interconnectedness through cultures, through generations, through people, is what will get us there. And I thank you so much for taking this time with us today and for having this conversation. And this is not going to be the last conversation that we have because I want to know more about that woman that you spoke about so highly. And to get to know more of the people that you have been working with, to hear more of the stories of the women that you traveled with and spoke with and learned from. So this is not the last that we will be having these types of conversations. So thank you again, Gabby, so much for joining us and for sharing your knowledge and your experience. And I look forward to many more conversations with you. Oh, the same. Thank you so much, Shamika, especially in this beautiful, like blossoming springtime. And, and um, like I say, I mean, Ospreys also, you know, they always remember how, to, where to go home to. Yes. You know, they always remember where to land. And home so is where the heart is. That's right. It was wonderful talking to you. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. And thank you all for joining us as well. And we hope that you continue to follow us. Go to www.akakeet.org and continue to see what we are doing this year and next year and the year after. Thank you.